Man is an animal, like all other animals in function and behavior, with one enormous difference, a soul and a mind. A mind which has a passionate lust to know. There are a wide variety of fields in the university, all the way from asking how does man feel, or asking how does man think, or asking how do people function or behave as political animals or behave as economic animals or behave as social animals or behave in institutions, all sorts of things that are being asked here. In fact, the whole place is nothing about more than asking the questions and trying to answer them, answering some of the questions which no longer we no longer phrase this way. We're all too grown up. When we were children, we asked them and we don't anymore. And yet behind it, you sense this drive, this drive of a mortal being which in some way has transcended his mortality this drive to answer the questions, who am I? And what am I doing here? And where did it start? And where is it going? And why? And who am I? Now, you see where he makes the crossover is right here. to do is I wanted the bass to bring the melody mm -hmm. out in a slower I see and then have this relation. and then have and the have other the voice, upper voice become, voice become a company. I see. Yeah. I would say the thing the thing is to if you're going to use the arpeggio here, let's make a virtue out of it and have it feel as a normal resolution of this motion that you've started here. Okay. So, 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 so turn it into, so into A flat, a flat. And yeah. then put the D yeah. flat. So I have the propensity too that I immediately have D flat. Then you, then you really owe it to us to keep this in canon with that, um, and, and you only do it that far. I tried very hard. You did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and failed. <Yeah. laughs>
That's sort of a free invention. <laughs> Nobody really knows what a galaxy is like, what a universe is like. And it's one of the outstanding problems in general relativity today. What sort of universes are we living in? I came from a very small college in Ireland where the physics department was three faculty members and uh, me, it was that small. I was the only undergraduate student there. And I, I had this idealized picture of what it was to be a great physicist, which meant someone who sat down in his office, you know, every morning and had three great ideas before lunch. As a student here, I found that the great physicists are not the people who have the greatest ideas. They're the people who work hardest. You sit there and you're working on a particular problem. And you know it's harder than you are really able to solve. And yet, it's an enormously exciting thing. It's you versus the world. When you're feeling good, you can visualize it as, as you taking on everything and beating it, you know. It's, it's an exhilarating feeling that you yourself, personally, me, you know, have this ability. And, and it's a frightening thing, you know, when, when things go well, you know. It really appalls me how, how great I feel, you know. And it's, 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 and, just, and it's purely just because of the fact that you're able to the, the whole thing rests upon you, you know, you're, you're in, in the center and, and you either deliver or not deliver. And it, it's a great feeling w which it's impossible to share, you know, j just how great it is when you do deliver. The Chinese in July 1054 saw a star which flared up and today we can see the debris from that July 1054 explosion moving, twisting, turning like a, a giant octopus. Fortunately, we are finding evidence in the sky of a kind of object which will be experimental model for the collapse of the universe itself, a black hole. A black hole is a star which has become so compact in the course of its normal development so tight that it can no longer hold itself up. It, the pull of gravity draws it in. And here, such a strange object epitomizes, acts as a kind of summary of all the mysteries that confront us about the universe itself. Because if we fall into such an object, then time has an unforgiving quality to it. It's as hard for us ever to come back out again as it is for us to turn back the tide of time. The unforgiving minutes keep ticking away. Uh, second by second, we find ourselves closer to the center and in the grip of these forces that squeeze everything down to indefinite compaction. This black hole gives us hope that we someday will understand this paradox of collapse of the universe, and with it, the glittering central mechanism of the universe, the greatest prize of all. The insight that we'll gain surely will give us a far deeper understanding of the whole place of man in the scheme of things. Count the numbers with me. 100 billion galaxies, and in each 100 billion suns, and only one relevant to us, only one close enough to give us life, only one. And think of the, there's an excitement about it. And here we are thinking about it, and who are we? Here we are thinking about it, and contemplating it, and worrying about it. A hundred billion galaxies, and in each, a hundred billion suns. If you're trying to assemble here the kinds of people we are trying to assemble, you ought to expect them to be different from each other, because talents just are not that precisely defined, not that well circumscribed. 
I think that people have learned at least as much at Princeton from each other, from the people with whom they're thrown in informal contacts, uh, as they have from their formal classroom experiences. And as all of you know, who have heard me on other occasions this year uh, talk about this, I feel very strongly that we share an obligation, that we share an obligation uh, to make this a place in which tolerance and in which mutual respect uh, really are much more than slogans. President Bowen. I have a question that's probably more mechanical than anything else, dealing with freshman requirements. I wanted to know if there is a particular reason why there are certain things that every freshman has to take, whether or not their interest lies in that direction. Far from being mechanical, that question really goes to the nature of the educational program quite directly. The system of distribution requirements that exists here is meant, first of all, to ensure that all Princeton graduates have some opportunity to study the varieties of learning experience that exist, to give them an opportunity early on uh, to get a sense of what they really might like to pursue in some depth so that they don't find themselves as juniors and seniors discovering for the first time that that discipline is where I really can make my mark, uh, only to arrive at that conclusion too late uh, to take advantage of other offerings. As I think about the question of the responsibility of the faculty to see to it that all points of view are considered and that we don't arrive too easily at whatever our own biases may have suggested, I'm always reminded of Marion Levy, uh, who in faculty meetings is well known for his tendency to speak against whatever has just been said. And Marion does that beautifully. He was, however, put to a severe test at one point, I remember last year, when after having objected vigorously to a motion that was before the faculty, he discovered that there was some real risk that the motion he had offered as a substitute was going to carry. <laughs> uh, at that point, uh, Marion rose to speak against his own motion. <laughs> and I think that illustrates, perhaps better than anything else I can say, uh, the kind of critical and probing habit of mind that one wants to see in the university, in the right degree, to be sure. What you're about to do is one of, is one of the great moments in, in, yeah. in all the plays. I mean, things like uh, to be imprisoned in the viewless winds and blown with restless violence round about the pendant world. What it does is immediately take your view um, uh, almost out to an astronaut's view. I mean, the, who has ever seen the pendant world? It's a right. live man's view about death rather than a dead man's view looking back. Is that what you said? No, no, no. Oh. It's an outburst that says, think, I thought about what it is to die. It's awful. You can't, you know, you, it's and, not, in other words, it's not controlled, I don't think. It's okay. Oh, okay, let's do it from, from the top. Then. Dost thou think, Claudio, if I would yield him my virginity, thou mightst be freed? Yes, he would gift thee. From this rank offense, so to offend him still. This night's the time that I should do what I abhor to name, or else thou diest. Thou shalt not do it. As you get closer and closer, when will I tell him? I better tell him right away and get it over with. Here I am at the door. What's the news? You know, I don't think she's, you know, I don't think, I don't think she's at a cocktail party. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to the last few lines of the fire speech. Poins! Bardolph! Pito! I'll starve ere I rob a foot further. A plague upon it when thieves cannot be true one to the other. Peace, you fat guts. Hal runs in. Lie down, lay thine ear close to the ground, and list if thou canst hear the tread of travelers. Have you any levers to lift me up again, being down? <laughs> now, ever since the days of Aristophanes, one of the most delicious components in broad physical comedy of assault has been the art of invective. 
And we have here two remarkably brilliant men, one very old and one young, with the sharpest minds for improvisatory verbal attack that Shakespeare ever invented. I'll be no longer guilty of this sin. This sanguine coward, this bed presser, this horseback breaker, this huge hill of flesh, splod, you starveling, you eel skin, you dried neat's tongue, you bull's pizzle, you stockfish, well, for breath to utter what is like to thee, you tailor's yard, you sheath, you bow case, you vile standing tuck. And he falls down, he can't go on. <laughs> As a student in architecture, this project from the engineering school has been fascinating, really visually and intellectually. By using this, these models, we're able to see through the shifting colors how the forces work within various structures, from Gothic cathedrals to railroad tracks and wheels. In the railroad model, we're trying to discover what actually causes so much noise. So, so others can work on quieting down various rail vehicles. Especially with cathedrals, we're able to learn through the pattern shown in the model how various parts of the cathedral actually work. What holds it up? How the structure reacts to the forces of gravity and wind? And we're seeing the answers. And it's been rewarding. To, to work on a project which can be directly applied in various ways, from problems in architecture to modern transportation. Really, really quite a bit of everything. That's really why I like it. 
but it's, it's, you know, it's a cliche to say something's a total experience, but Princeton is in the sense that you can, you can do just about what, what you want, when you want it. One of the really great features in terms of Princeton is social interactions, which is true of in any kind of situation, uh, meeting different people from various various geographical areas and so with all kinds of different aspirations and desires. And the pub is near the library, so after you get finished studying, you want to go get a drink, you know, a couple nightcaps before you go to bed and stuff. And uh, not too many, but just enough. <laughs> well, there are a lot of things that we'd like to see changed. I think Princeton has made a commitment to try to change, diversify, you know, diversify the place. You know, there are more women, there are more blacks, and other minorities. It's small enough so that you can take advantage of everything, but it's big enough so that it has everything. You'd like me to tell you what the Princeton experience is like? Well, I'll be very happy to do so. <laughs> it's hell. <laughs> When you feel sad or under a curse, your life is bad. If your prospects are worse, your wife is sighing and crying, and your old tree is dying. Tempers are and teeth are decaying, and creditors are weighing your purse. Your mood and your road are both a deep blue. Yes, sir, you'd bet that jokes had nothing on you. Don't forget that when you get to heaven, you'll be blessed. Yes, it's all for the best. No one's got to be oppressed. Yes, it's all for the best. A lot of people tell you that the college years are the best years of your life, but so far, I've been in the library too much to, <laughs> to do anything else, so. My own direction has changed just from the people that I've been exposed to. I was previously interested in maybe social science or something like that, and have taken two art courses and have decided to 
you know, do a 90 degree turn just because of the certain professors that I've been exposed to and, and the resources at Princeton. Well, see, what I'm really trying to say, I guess, about your thesis, and maybe it's just off the track and not at all what you want to include, is how sympathetic do you now feel towards Havelock Ellis? You see what I'm trying to say? I mean, has he become, <laughs> has he become a friend, Judith? Gosh, that's, I don't know, it's really strange because I had never heard of him when I started to do my thesis on him. It was one of those, oh, I couldn't find the information on the five people I really cared about, yeah, you know, and, time. yes, and the time was running out, so, um, I don't know, I have very mixed feelings. I think I basically dislike him, and the only thing that tempers me is people like you telling me that I should be more sympathetic. <laughs> I wasn't sure that it needed to be a whole chapter in itself, which it oh, is. Oh, that it wouldn't mean on his general thought? Yes. Oh, no, I was just going to stick it in with his oh, life see. and tighten it oh, up. Right. Any other comments? Um, no, not really. I think it's going to be very, very good. I really do. I'm very impressed with it. It's quite dispassionate for you. <laughs> Really? Almost as dis I me, mean, I don't think you want to get any more dispassionate. You might lose your special gifts. <laughs> Another question. A passion. No, I'm very, very pleased. Really. The other thing that we're going to need to do, I think, is to emphasize what has long been one of the characteristics of Princeton, namely a single faculty. A faculty that teaches undergraduates, teaches graduate students and does research, and in which those three things reinforce each other. And if a student were to ask me why he should consider coming to Princeton, uh, I would tell him, because here there is an opportunity uh, to push as far in your subject as your own abilities and as the quality of your mind will let you go. It's the question of uh, why do physics, and particular, why do general relativity, because it's totally non-practical, but, but in, in, in the same sense, I, I, I think it, it, it's part of our humanness to, to pursue the unknown. It, 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 it's a, one is straining in every range of, of, of endeavor to go out to the limit and beyond it. And in that sense, we are seeking the furthest limit we know, which is the universe and our position in it. these individual questions on specific points, I think to myself, the diversity of opinion on any question involving human beings in this little community are absolutely unbelievable. The question is simply, are they teaching basically or trying to inculcate in their students the ideas of tolerance, patience, understanding, which are the, are the only things that are going to pull us through these very difficult times. Well, George, as an alumnus, you would know that perhaps the most important thing that we can teach is that few answers are known now, fewer answers yet are known for all time. And if people who come out of Princeton learn only that there's so much more to learn and something about how to learn more and how to get along with the remarkable variety of people who inhabit this earth, we will have done very well indeed. All of the answers are not in, and one does live with imperfection and with ambiguity. But one lives with those characteristics of the human condition in, I hope, a mood that also contains real confidence in the future.